So to start, can we have you say and spell your name? Sure. Ellen Joyner, E-L-L-E-N-J-O-Y-N-E-R. Wonderful. Well, today is Thursday, July 26th, and we are at Bombshell in Holly Springs, North Carolina, um, with an interview for the Wellcrafted NC Project. So Ellen, to start with, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from, and how did you get here? Yeah, so um, I'm from Cary, and well, not initially, but basically grew up there since I was in, in elementary school, and went on to um, college in East Carolina, and got an undergraduate, and then got a master's in business from Meredith here in Raleigh, and then kind of moved around in the area, and then ended up in Holly Springs about 13 or 14 years ago. Yeah. Um, and I know that you you kind of started home brewing. That's yes. that's where you got your going. Can you talk a little bit about how you how you got involved in home brewing? What sure, was the sure. Um, well, I found I discovered craft beer, and believe it or not, it was like Carolina brewing is craft beer. Um, drinking it at the Devil's Ridge Country Club or the club that we played golf at. And so I really was starting to hone in and say, oh my God, you know, this is so much better beer than the stuff that you traditionally were thinking of or that you drank in college because that's what you could afford. And my brother bought me a homebrew kit for Christmas back in 2005, I believe. And the very first batch of beer I brewed turned out really, really well. And I was hooked at that point. Do you remember what that first batch of beer, what, what it was? It was just a pale ale. So it was done with liquid malt extract on the stove, top it off with distilled water and pray. And I can remember the instruction sheet was like Xerox pages that was about three pages long and it was missing a lot of steps. And I remember saying, oh my God, is this gonna turn out? Because there's so much I think I'm missing. And then after you do one, and then you discover some of the pains that you have in your first home brew, such as adding the corn sugar to the individual bottles, you start to build on it. And very quickly, it becomes a very expensive hobby. <laughs> um, what, you know, going from that, what resources have you kind of drawn on over time to grow as a brewer? You know, a lot of reading. I mean, thank God for the internet. You don't have to go and look at encyclopedias or go look up card catalog stuff at the library anymore. I mean, with the, with the internet, you know, you can pretty much find everything that you need to know on there. So anything I could put my hands on and read is what I did. And then I would go and try it. And one of the things that I um, did as a home brewer is I was more trying to understand what was going on. And so I kept brewing the same recipe over and over, just tweaking it and trying to get the perfect recipe, whereas a lot of home brewers will go out and brew a whole lot of different styles, and every time they're brewing a different style. And I just took a different approach because I wanted, I guess, more the science behind it and understanding what was going on. So that was kind of how I would brew is pick one recipe and then just keep trying it until I loved it and then move on and do something different. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about how you went through the process of maybe even developing or perfecting recipes? Recipes, sure. Um, you know, it would be tasting it and saying, what did I like or what did I not like? Did it have, you know, too much toasted or roasted or biscuity? And, you know, was the hops too overpowering? Did they linger? Was it astringent? And then I'd go read and find out why. And I can remember, you know, doing different things such as, you know, stabilizing my mash pH, not understanding when you first start to brew what pH really does in brewing and you know doing things like that to filtering my water um, and running it through a chlorine filter you know sending my water off for analysis so that i could start making adjustments and it, it really was just it builds upon itself and it just came back to taste and then i'd give it to all our friends you know what do you like about it and they would say what they liked or didn't like and that's how i'd go about fine-tuning it you know i kind of have this little motto is it as good as it can be and sometimes we use that here. When we do a beer and it sells really well, and then we say, is it as good as it can be? No, we might can add another pound of orange peel to it and it'll be better. And so we kind of take the same approach here. Yeah. Um, so uh, do, you have, do you have something that you would consider to be like your favorite thing? What was the thing that hooked you from that homebrew kit to you know, not just going, well, I did it once, it was fine. What, was there a favorite thing that was really the hook for you? Um, I think it was that I made it. I like to make things. 
and you know even growing up as a kid I was a very crafty person and the gratification came fairly quickly I mean it's not like law, like doing your lawn where it's instant gratification for the work you put in you still have to wait a couple weeks and I, it was just it was the science behind it it was you know let's change the yeast up on it and see how it changes and as we grew and as I brought Michelle into the fold in 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 brewing we bought bigger and bigger systems, bigger and bigger pots. I mean, we should have just gone for the gunzo at the very beginning. We would have spent far less money. And being able to say, here's one batch, let's put three different yeast strains. Let's use five gallons with this yeast strain and then see how it worked. And I, I think that was just, it was the experimental portion of it. Yeah, and you mentioned Michelle. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about kind of the path from, from the homebrew kit in here at Bombshell and uh, how, 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 how you guys happened. came together and yeah. how we got to this point. So um, we were avid golfers, were being were. Um, <laughs> I don't play anymore. So anytime it would rain, we would go brewery tour hopping. And back in 2006, 2007, 2008, um, there was only a couple breweries in the area. And so we pretty much stuck to Carolina Brewing and Aviator. And one day Michelle was saying, you know, she was like, we hate corporate America why don't we do this? And so I was like, are you serious? And she said, sure. So, you know, I taught her how to homebrew. We spent a year kind of writing the business plan, teaching her how to homebrew, seeing if it was something we really wanted to do. And, um, and then from there it was like, okay, let's just take this risk. Let's take this leap because if it fails, we still have time to recover um, at our age. And that's how it started. Yeah. And you know, you, you mentioned kind of the corporate culture and the corporate background. Do you, do you feel that kind of having that experience before diving in to the brewery has helped? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I probably wouldn't have done it had I not had my corporate background. The thing that corporations do is they instill process. Um, you get skills, you get the managerial skills, you get the financial skills. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have had, one, I wouldn't have had the financial means to have done it. And two, it gave me the confidence to do it. And I think, you know, having business partners do it with you just made it a little bit easier of a step than to have done it all by myself. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what was the, do you remember kind of when the light changed, when, when the, the switch flipped to just go from continuing with home brewing to opening? like? What, did, what were the processes? What, what steps did you take? So for a long time, it just seemed like we were talking it. We were talking it. And finally, it was like, okay, for a year and a half, I've been, we've been homebrewing constantly, and we're either going to do this or we need to stop talking about it and just saying it's going to be a hobby. And I believe it was summer of 2012. Um, we were at a July 4th pool party and we had taken some of our home brew and we're serving it. And we just happened to walk up to one of the city councilmen and saying, we're, we're, we're serious, we do wanna, do you know of any buildings? And he happened to know of a building and that had been sitting vacant for a while. And he says, I'll introduce you to the landlord and let's go talk. And so we showed up at this particular building and we were like, it's perfect. It's close to our houses. And, you know, we went back and forth. We didn't initially jump on it. Um, but after about three or four months, we finally were like, okay, let's do it. And, you know, it structured our business, got it all legal and signed the lease. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced in starting up from scratch? Sure. Oh, um, one, understanding what equipment we really needed to have. Um, we not having been commercial brewers, not having worked in the commercial brewing industry, we didn't really know what equipment we needed. So we found somebody to consult with us to um, kind of go over equipment and what we needed. We knew what our financing was and what we had the money to spend on. Uh, then, you know, you're building out something and I don't have a construction background, none of us did. And we're suddenly running a project that needs to happen. What we did know is it needs to happen fast because every day that it's not happening and that we're not open, we're paying rent. And so we, um, 
went through the venture of you know hiring the contractor and there was a lot of days nothing was going on here and us just not having run a construction project you know keeping sometimes keeping people on site to do the work because they wanted to come for a full day's worth of work and if it was just a tiddly thing to put a bar top in you didn't see them until they had enough to do to occupy a day they were running between jobs i think that was frustrating but yeah so what was it that that led you to choose the site was it just availability or did you did you pick the first site you looked at um it was availability there's not a lot of availability that is an existing building in holly springs we looked at a couple of other sites but once we found out what the price was we were like "Ooh, a little too um much money and this one was close to our houses because i live less than two miles from here so we loved the location, um, and we just wanted to stay in Holly Springs. And yeah. There just wasn't a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So how would you define the main mission of Bombshell? The main mission? Um, when we started out, we wanted to, you know, it's funny how the business plan has changed, but we wanted to make really good, solid beers that people enjoyed, and then we wanted to be a part of the community, and we wanted to place for people to go, you know, not necessarily the cheers bar, but something where people felt comfortable and we wanted females to feel comfortable being able to walk into a bar by themselves. And so making great beer and making a community environment was, you know, in my opinion, our mission. And I believe the other girls will say something similar as well. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about the name. How did you decide on the name yeah, Bombshell? So, Bombshell? The name found us. And um, when Michelle and I were brewing and leaving it out to our friends on the golf course, they we were much younger, we were blondes, and they referred to us as the Bombshells. And I don't know, I don't know why, never considered myself that. And so they would always be like, oh, the, the girls, the blonde bombshells have beer on hole number six or hole number 18, be sure to get some. And so when it came time to naming it, we started going through, you know, what are names? And we were trying to think of names associated with the town and everybody kept calling us bombshell. And it was finally like, let's just call ourselves bombshell. And that's really how it came about. Yeah. Um, so, are there particular resources or people who, during the process of going from home brewing to opening the doors, were particularly influential or um, helpful? It, you know what, the community is helpful. The home, I mean, the the craft brew community is very helpful. And the first year, um, we weren't open, but we went to our first craft brewers conference, and it was fabulous because I come from corporate where you stood and you were the vendor I actually got to be the participant you know and when you were going to pack you're packing blue jeans and tennis shoes and t-shirts and you're headed off to this craft brewers conference and you check in and they give you a bag and I'm like oh my god this thing weighs forever and it's filled with beer and they have brew stations so in between all of the segments you get to go and try different samples of different beer i was like i'm hooked i'm in the right place i can remember texting and sending all my friends back in corporate america <laughs> what i was going through and they were like so jealous because we'd come from bigger trade shows where they were just awful um so we would you know do that and we met a lot of people and they would give us their cards and they were like call us at any time and so there was some people that were more local that had, um, you know, director of brewery operations at Natty Greens, or and they were they would we'd call them up and we'd ask questions and they would say, oh yeah, go here, do this. So we had you know several people. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the size of the brewery when you first opened, like your production size sure. and, and equipment? So we're a fifteen barrel brew house, and we started out with three fermenters we were going to do four and the day that the people showed up to um we were originally looking at a 10 barrel system and the day that the scoping out and the vendor was coming they gave us an kind of another quote that said look for a few dollars more you can get a 15 barrel brew house I mean, typical upselling right and we looked at it and we we're like, oh, wow. And we had to make a couple sacrifices and, and one was cutting out a fermenter and, but in the end, so glad we went with the 15 barrel. And so 
We started out with three fermenters. Basically, we had 60 barrels worth of fermentation space. Um, today, with our latest purchase, we're up to 225 barrels of fermentation space, which, you know, in a perfect world, if everything turned in two, two and a half weeks, roughly 5,500 barrels would be our capacity right now. Um, of course, we make lagers, which slows things down, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, we, we've grown, you know, between year one and year two, not a ton of growth, but then we really started to grow after that. Yeah. And in terms of uh, staff, how has the staff and kind of staff responsibilities changed and grown over time? Greatly. I mean, one, adding more salespeople to cover more geography drivers because we're a self-distributing brewery. So we have basically two drivers. Um, we've had to buy vehicles to go on the road. We started out with Bessie, our 1989 Isuzu box truck, and we bought her because she had a lift gate. And um, now she's parked across the street in the field. She's out in the pasture. Um, and then we've bought vans, you know, a little more economical. And so salespeople, staff, brewery staff, um, when we first opened the tap room, it was us working it and our friends. And very quickly, we were getting worn out because for the first six months that we were open, I was still working my corporate job. And so I'd leave the corporate job and come here and work till midnight and weekends, and it took its toll. So we quickly realized, you know, we're legit. We need professional bartenders and people that are going to be in here. Um, and then found, you know, it was time to take on and get a general manager for the tap room and had the right candidate and has never looked back. He's just been fabulous working for us. Yeah. Um, do you, did you carry over any of your homebrew recipes no. when you went into commercial? No. Ditched all of them? Ditched all of them. <laughs> um, do you have, are any of the beers that are on, that you guys are producing now, legacy beers from when you opened or have you no, ch kind every, of changed a lot? everything has changed everything has changed um you know one of the things that i see that people do is you open and your first six months of brewing your beer hopefully is good but it gets better um you know the brewer is trying to learn the system it's like getting a brand new gas grill and the first time you go to use it that steak is going to probably be a little overcooked or undercooked because you're just not used to how it works so the brewers that have worked for us have gotten progressively better as time has gone by and we've learned the system and then you know we've had to adapt to the market changing and the taste of what people are wanting you know Five years ago, there wasn't a lot of fruit and beer, and now everywhere you look, there's fruit and beer. So um, there's different styles of IPAs. So yeah, nothing has carried over. Yeah. Well, as somebody who used to homebrew, you mentioned a couple of uh, kind of trendier style uh, pieces. Are there particular beer trends today that you're a big fan of, or even that you aren't a big fan of? Um, I mean, I love I love a sour. We don't do any here for they need to be in a separate facility. Um, the fruit beers, some of them I love and some of them are too sweet for me. I'm, and then I love an IPA and pretty much all the IPAs I love. Um, I prefer my IPA not to be totally in your face with hops. Some people really want that. I like mine to be a little bit rounder, a little bit more um, balanced with the malt. So I like a better mouthfeel with my IPAs and then really getting your IPA from the late addition hops and the dry hopping to get the aromas and the flavors. Right. More so than the bitterness. Right. Um, well, I guess also thinking back on outside of Bombshell, but in the region, can you talk a little bit about how the triangle beer scene has changed since you guys opened? Yeah, a new brewery opens about every day. I mean, there's one opening while we talk, I'm sure. And um, the consumer, I think that the age group of people drinking craft beer is a lot lower, younger than when I was coming through because when I graduated from college, I just didn't have money and we were still drinking. What can I buy a case for $10 for? Um, and now you're finding college kids that are drinking um, craft beer. So that has changed. Obviously, there is a lot more breweries. Um, 
so the competition has gotten harder. And the consumer is always about what's new. You don't find them going for their staple. You know, everybody used to always say, this is what I drink every weekend. I might venture a little bit and try something, but for the most part, I always keep the same thing in the refrigerator. And the craft brewer doesn't do that. You know, the craft brewer, the craft drinker doesn't do that. I think that they're, you can see that for the fact that you can buy singles now and mix and make your own, you know, six packs and 12 packs as you will. Right. Um, so here at Bombshell, do you have a beer that you consider to be the flagship beer? Um, so our Head Over Hops IPA is our flagship. It is our biggest seller. And H-Town Lager is probably our second biggest seller. And it's two different drinkers, right? You've got your lager, I don't want any hops. And then you've got your hoppier beer. And so those are our two biggest uh, sellers that we have here all year. Um, we make such a variety of beers now. We make a lot of one-offs. And you know we make them one time, and then if they catch on, we keep them in the portfolio or we'll bring them back periodically. And then if they don't, then you know they go on and the next one comes about. Yeah. So can you, and there, I'm sure there isn't one, but can you talk a little bit about maybe a typical week here in the brewery for you, from your perspective? Yeah, um, so typically, because I do most of the bookkeeping, I was doing all of it, and we've just recently hired somebody to take some of that off. So it's usually, you know, doing the bookkeeping, checking with orders, production orders, you know, Monday morning start out with a production meeting. That's the very first thing that happens every Monday morning is a production meeting so that sales knows what's going on and when beers are going to come out and that everybody's on the same page. And then we discuss what, you know, new beers we need to make or what needs to get back in tank because it's selling really well. And then um, it's, you know, problem solving, you know, oh, we're out of CO2 gas or it's getting low, make a phone call. You know, the CO2 people are supposed to always be here, but they don't. So, or it's, you know, this is broke, get this done. It's keeping up with, you know, your daily receipts, all of your bookkeeping, your orders, answering the phone calls, you know, people wanting product. Um, it's, you know, answering to the employees that need help with something, making sure that, you know, we have all of our supplies, ordering of brewing materials, most of the, um, Brew materials, the brewer orders his own grain. Um, we don't have to do that, but if he needs hops, then you know I'm trying to locate hops for him and just kind of laying out the production schedule to make sure that we have all of the supplies um, when we need them without bringing too much in at a time. Right. Um, so can you talk about some of the biggest challenges that you feel like you face in opening the biggest brewery and growing and the growing. brewery too? One is knowing when you need another human because it's that, you know, cart before the horse type thing where you really need the help, but the revenue isn't quite there to support it. And so you end up asking a little bit more of your current employees and to generate that little bit of extra dollars so then you can afford to go and hire somebody and then you got to wait for that to kind of pay off and turn off. And I think that every entrepreneur will tell you that is a huge struggle of when to put the next person on staff. Um, the other thing is affordability of certain things. You know, we want to be able to offer our staff so many things like 401ks and various things, but it's expensive. And trying to get to that point that we can provide those, those are, those are big challenges. Um, making sure that every customer that comes in here has a good experience and addressing you know customers when they do have complaints which isn't very often but occasionally you do and and you need to jump on it right away and not let it fester and and solve for that and things breaking i mean i always joke with my uh, brewer that i need to start writing a blog about the day in the life of a brewery owner because there's always something that's unexpected that goes wrong that you weren't counting on. Um, you know, some days you just feel like, oh my God, it's been three weeks of nothing but a gray cloud over top of our, our heads. And then you'll go weeks and everything is, is wonderful and you're like, oh yes, we're finally cruising. And then the van breaks down and it's a $2,000 expense. And oh boy, we need the van. How are we gonna make our deliveries? Well, who has a vehicle? You know, it's 
those challenges all the time. It's, you know, you just, you start to laugh sometimes you have to because something breaks. And, you know, I've learned how to fix boilers, repair sight glasses, how to restart my chiller because the breaker trips. Um, you know, there's certain things you just learn. Oh, I know what's gone wrong and you get in there and you do it. You know, our keg washer broke. I got a phone call from my brewer and he said, keg washer's not drawing up sanitizer. What do I do? I said, check valve. And I come in here and replace the check valve. So yeah, I've had to learn to do a lot of mechanical things um, that I never thought I would have done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of looking back at your hopes and dreams when you guys first opened to mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. Are there things that kind of really surprise you now? Things that you never would have anticipated five, ten years ago, even when um, you were first home brewing? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely things that surprise me. Um, one, how many people know who I am, but I don't remember their names always. <laughs> um, I think just the amount, I never thought we would have as many employees as we have. Um, when we were writing out the business plan or I was home brewing, when we knew we were going to open this, I think we always thought we could do it with three or four people. And you can't. So I think that aspect has surprised me at how much labor it actually takes to make things work. Yeah. 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 So um, one of the, the trends that we often uh, see with breweries, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, is this um, a focus on the community and giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the work that you guys do? Here? Sure, sure. So we do a lot of fundraisers. Um, you know, there's so many people that need help these days and so many charities that are looking um, for avenues to generate and raise money for their charities. And so we have a venue here and so we offer it up. We do, um, we've always done periodic different um, charity events that were maybe once every quarter or once every other month, but now we have pretty established, you know, first Fridays and third Fridays where we're raising money for a charity. We still do, you know, a Saturday here or something else for another charity. And, you know, we just want to be part of the community and it drives also new people here that come out to support that charity who might not have known about us. So it opens doors for more customers and people to um, enjoy our product and feel like they're also supporting, you know, the charity. So that's, you know, we really feel very compelled to help out in the community and be one of those avenues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, putting, uh, thinking, thinking forward, uh -huh. where would you like to see Bombshell go in the next five to ten years? What are your, sure. your goals for the business? Um, one is to, you know, expand. One, we're outgrowing our location. So we know we have to do something different as far as the location goes. So we're in the process now of figuring out what that's going to be. We have a few months to make that decision. and. You know, so we definitely want to be able to provide a bigger venue for people and as well as expand further geography wise with our beer in the state. You know, when we first started out, we wanted to be a regional brewery. That was our goal to be a regional brewery and regional breweries now are actually falling in sales and everything has become so hyper local that you can actually do really well just staying local. So I don't think our dream anymore is to necessarily cross state lines. It may happen in five or six years, but I would say in five years, we'd want to have, you know, pretty much statewide coverage of the beer and, um, and then start, you know, to build a, a place for either relatives to take over and us retire. Um, yeah. Not retire in five years, we're far from that, but. <laughs> You know, ultimately, I don't want to have to return to corporate America. <laughs> yeah. Well, following up on one thing you, you mentioned just now, um, you were talking about statewide distribution. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your distribution path now and kind of how you got to the point where you, of where we are today? Sure. So we originally obviously start as center and close to your brewery and you just start expanding out. So what we did is we looked at 
you know, the triangle first, then we ventured to Durham and Chapel Hill, and then we needed to expand further, so you start looking at how easy access and where the people are. So we naturally went west first towards Greensboro and Winston-Salem, and that way we could stick on the 40-85 corridor, and there is just so much opportunity there. It's definitely more challenging to sell the further away you get from the brewery because of just the notoriety, and there's so many more breweries in those areas as well. Um, you know, if there wasn't any breweries in Greensboro and, and Winston-Salem, then it probably wouldn't be so difficult. Uh, you know, the next step that we're looking at is, you know, to go to the beach. And we're slightly doing Greenville. We've done, we've done bits and pieces in Greenville, but not enough business there to justify a full-time salesperson or running of a vehicle down there. So we... Um, are looking at the extreme parts of the states and with that whether or not we're going to self-distribute or whether we're going to pick up a distributor so that's kind of on the table right now as far as where we're expanding but yeah we I mean we start you start central I mean that's where you can get to the fastest and for the first you know we were delivering off of Bessie we didn't even have her for five months so we were delivering in our personal cars for the first five months and then Bessie would come and then we were still delivering with our personal cars and even to this day every once in a while if a vehicle's in the shop we do that um, you know we're doing a little bit in Fayetteville but there's a lot of opportunity down there and that's not but an hour away so you really that's how we're kind of expanding where can we get to the easiest and that there's enough business to justify sending a driver down there with enough orders um, to cover your cost. Yeah, uh, and right now, kind of in terms of, I guess, percentage of sales, tap room versus canning versus um, other yeah. distribution. So, How would you say that balances out? Um, we definitely do more wholesale business than tap room business, and it is. It's about a. 65 35 split 35 percent tap room yeah right now mm -hmm. yeah um and and one of the things that michelle mentioned earlier when we were talking to her was an interest in self-canning mm -hmm. you were going you guys were going to start looking at that can you talk a little bit about kind sure. of the decision to do that well we've been using a mobile canner and the great thing about the mobile canners is that when you're first starting to try and get store placements you don't get them all they don't just they're not just there the day you say i have cans you have to work to get store placements and then you have to prove that you can sell the beer through their stores in order to get more and more shelf space so you can't afford a canning line that you can't you just can't justify it until you reach a certain point it's much cheaper to have a mobile canner we finally reached the volume where the mobile canner was starting to be not cost effective, not timely for us because beer was having to sit longer than it needed to in order to schedule a date with a mobile canner. And mobile canners, because for them to show up, you had to do a certain amount of volume or the price was prohibitive. And so a lot of the one-off beers, we just couldn't justify, I'm only gonna can nine barrels because the mobile canner didn't wanna show up for nine barrels. And so we would have to get two or three beers in process and then can them all at the same time in order to justify the cost. So we finally hit that volume level where it said, it, we've, we're hurting ourselves, just the mobile canner is expensive, beer sitting around longer than it needs to, it needs to keep moving, and we're getting bottlenecks because of the mobile canner. So we just recently purchased um, a canning line and we're just waiting for it to show up. Um, well, as you know, one of the things that we haven't mentioned in this interview yet, but you know, Bombshell is a 100% woman-owned mm -hmm. business, um, which is not commonly found in nope. the beer industry. Can you talk a little bit about being a woman-owned business and the importance of that sure. to you? Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think when we first started, the, when that very first craft brewers conference that we went to, they said like 2% of the brewing industry was females. I, I, it's higher than that now. And women are definitely, have become more of a craft drinker as well. And so they're wanting to be in the craft beer industry. You know, there was, there's goods and bads of it. I think there's certain things that women 
are just more apt to do. When we were building the tap room, we had the woman touch on it. Um, we wanted it to not just be in the corner of a warehouse with a bunch of picnic tables and, you know, slap some stuff on the walls. I mean, we actually took some real thought into putting a design to it, um, making it a nice space that people wanted to hang out into because it's about length of stay. And then, you know, I think there's certain levels of details that we as women, our brains are a little bit more programmed into. Um, perhaps a little bit more customer insight about building that customer experience, plus our corporate backgrounds being on customer service side of things, built that. And then there's been challenges, you know, physically, it's hard for me to lift the 50 pound grain bag and, or the 55 pounds, they're almost all 55 pounds. There are certain things that, you know, I'm not, I can't lift a half barrel keg. We just, I can't do it without help. You know, a guy can certainly do that from an aspect of getting along and other people helping, you know, we've just had wonderful help when we've needed it with other breweries that have been over in a heartbeat. We had, um, last fall, we heard this big bang, actually my brewer's wife, they were eating lunch in the back on a Saturday, because he's not normally here on Saturdays, and they heard this big thunder and realized it was coming from the cooler and a big ice block had built up in the fan unit and fallen and water was gushing out everywhere and immediately it was like oh my god what do we do and i texted one of uh, the guys at carolina brewing and within five minutes he was walking in the door and this was on a saturday he happened to be right around here at the food lion and so he came over and you know, everybody jumped in trying to solve the problem and we ended up finding out, you know, what was going on. We got it fixed and then on Monday, the repairman showed up and um, added a little device so that the unit would cut off one hour every night. I mean, those are little things that you don't think about that if it's not properly draining, it's gonna build up ice. And um, so I, I think there's goods and bads of being the female. There's, you have to look at it as the positives and as Michelle used to say, you know, not everybody has to have a, a beard to brew beer. <laughs> and, uh, um, so if a woman walked through the door right now, mm -hmm. said she wanted to open a brewery, what, what would you tell her? What advice or uh, cautions uh, would you give her? I hate to discourage anybody. Um, it's a lot more work than you ever will dream that it's gonna be and a lot more work and a lot of sleepless nights and takes way more money than you thought it was gonna take. But if that's really your passion, you'll be successful. And be very critical of yourself as well. I think we're our worst critics, you know, this beer is good, but it ain't the best. Let's improve on the recipe. I think you have to be able to take that approach and listen to you know feedback and most people won't tell you to your face that something's not good they just don't return so um yeah to the female if it's your passion then go for it but find the right location find the right team of people to work for you and have fun yeah so we talked a little bit about where where you wanted to see bombshell go over the next five years mm -hmm. but Thinking kind of broader, like the North Carolina or even the beer industry as a whole, what, where do you see the industry going over the next five or 10 years? Um, I think for a while it's gonna stay even more and more local and it's gonna become more crucial for people to stay local as far as the breweries go because what I'm seeing is the big guys are buying up some of the craft brewers they're putting the squeeze on the corporate accounts because we're feeling it, um, you know, because they're losing shelf space. The other thing that I see is going to happen is just the cost of things are going up. And I think this is going to be a real challenge because the big guys, the big dogs have the resources to drive prices down and can afford to take lower margins than the smaller brewers. Um, it wouldn't surprise me in the next couple years if everything on the shelf from a local craft brewer goes up by a dollar 
you know, where you're used to paying a $9.99 price point, that it's going to become a $10.99 price point. I mean, ingredients are going up, and the more brewers that come in, the demand for hops and grain is growing, and so those prices are going up. Um, and it, I think it's it's going to be a challenge. And if you don't try and capitalize on your local market and your taproom sales, distribution is just going to get harder because the grocery stores are catering to the big guys because they're offering better pricing, they're offering deals and um, kind of trying to squeeze the little guy out. So you really have to look at your model and how do you become a destination within your own community to where you're just like the restaurant that they go to every week. You need to become, you know, that craft brewer that they go to every week. Yeah. So now we hit on kind of the fun questions at mm -hmm. the end. What's your favorite beer from Bombshell? Mm. It varies by week. It really does because your tastes change on a weekly basis. So some weeks, I mean, I love Lady in Red. We're getting ready to come out with our Oktoberfest, and I love, love our Oktoberfest. Um, I like our, I, you know, drink our Head Over Hops a lot. It's off tap right now um, due to one of those unfortunate incidences. And I love, um, I love our IPA of the Month program. We've really produced some really, really tasty IPAs. Um, some days I love to drink H-Town Lager. I can't say that I have a favorite. Yeah. Well, uh, to follow up on the one thing you just said there, can you talk a bit about the IPA of the Month Sure, project? sure. So the IPA of the Month program, when we were sitting down um, first of the year, we were like, we gotta, we gotta come up with something to hook people and get them to be a repeat buyer every month. And IPAs just sell well in North Carolina. And Devin was wanting to do, you know, to try some different things with some experimental hops or some lesser known hops. You know, Citra is huge, but at one point Citra was not a big hop until it got discovered. So we wanted to play with, you know, what can we do with some different hops that people aren't familiar with and see what they turn out like. And so we created this IPA of the month where we would use a unique or a different hop and do a different style IPA. So sometimes we do New England styles, sometimes we do a fruitier IPA, sometimes we do just a regular IPA or a white IPA or red IPA. And every month it's different. And so we have, it's pre-sold out for the entire year. And um, we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do next year. So, yeah. yeah. But that, that's what the IPA of the month program is, is getting people to try a different IPA every month. Yeah. Well, this question is probably going to be even more difficult than that than the one about your favorite beer here. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than Bombshell? Oh boy, God, I never get out to drink anymore. Um, so my go-to staple has always been Sierra Pale Ale, and that was what I called my Bud Light, um, meaning that's what I would always have in my refrigerator. I'd always pick that up, and I still, every once in a while, will go back and just say, I don't want a bombshell, give me a syrup pale ale. I try different things. I'm kind of like that same consumer that says what's new, and if it sounds interesting, then I'm going to try it. But I can't say that there's anything that I always have um, in my refrigerator or that I'm always going out and seeking that's from North Carolina. There's so many great breweries here. I mean, there's some really, really good local breweries and I will always pick them when I go someplace over anybody else. Yeah. 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 Well, you probably don't have a ton of free time. <laughs> no. But when you're not here, when uh -huh. you're not working, what are some of your favorite things to do? How do you like to spend your free time? Um, sleep. Um, yeah, I mean, I used to golf, and I still every once in a while get out and play golf, and I hope to one day get back to playing on a, on a, on a regular basis. I like to do some photography things, and I haven't, I haven't done a ton of that as I used to. Um, I used to, you'd always find me with a camera everywhere. I made a calendar for all of our friends every Christmas of the previous year and, you know, what was going on. So I do a little bit of gardening, and that's, you know, play with my dog. Yeah. and spend time with my niece and nephew. Yep. So that's pretty much the end of the prepared questions that I have. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you would want to have kind of as part of the bigger overall story? Um, I 
No, I think, okay. I think we're good. Awesome. Well, All right. thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.